right, we are live. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. It is August 26th. This is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. It's a, as Senator McCormick said, it's a brisk morning, uh, a, a transition from what we've had in the month of August and July. It was pretty hot. Um, today, we're just we're going to look at um, some bills that have come to us from the House, one of which we've taken significant testimony on, that's H-663, the uh, act relating to expanding access to contraception. And I think as presented to us in the House was a bill that prevents um, unwanted pregnancy. So um, Jen, do you wanna remind us where we are with that bill? And I know, and then Debbie, I think you wanted to add some comments. Sure. Uh, good morning, Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. So we had walked through, as the chair said, we've gone through H663 as it came over from the House, and you were going to be, and I can't recall if you actually got an opportunity to consider uh, some language from the Senate Education Committee that would add some additional provisions on school wellness and provision of menstrual hygiene products. Um, so I think that amendment is also posted if that's something that you wanted to look at or if you wanted to, to have um, Senator Ingram set that up first. Why don't we do that? Why, uh, Senator Ingram, why don't you give us a, a heads up on what the amendment is and then maybe Jen, you can walk it through on the screen with us. Sure. Great, Great. yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so Senate Education um, had been working on a a miscellaneous um, bill um, that it looks like is not going to move um, on the education side. So we had uh, requested uh, to add um, a couple of uh, pieces. Um, one is about uh, school wellness programs uh, in general and then having an, an advisory council on wellness. But wellness has been looked at primarily as um, sort of nutrition and, you know, PE kinds of things, but this would uh, actually add, uh, especially in light of, you know, the um, impact of COVID, uh, a more comprehensive um, idea about, about um, wellness. And um, it includes actually um, uh, um, consulting the Director of Trauma Prevention and Resil Resilience Development and the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory um, Council. Um, to create um, kind of more comprehensive uh, wellness programs. So that's one uh, part of it. And then the other part is, um, uh, this was originally a standalone bill actually introduced by um, our very own chair, uh, Senator Lyons, uh, about making menstrual hygiene products available uh, equitably to all female students um, uh, at no cost. Um, and basically this fits in quite well with the um, section on contraceptives because it's the same sort of principle um, that the school nurse would make um, decisions um, at, at each local school about how best to make available um, feminine hygiene uh, products uh, in the same way that the, the contraceptives uh, would be uh, available uh, in the other, other bill. Um, so that's, um, that's basically um, the two things that Senate Education would request that we would um, kind of include in this, uh, in this bill. Okay, um, so any questions for uh, Senator Ingram? All right, so Jen, can you uh, share your screen and, and walk us through that proposed amendment? Uh, yes. Uh, just one last question. Was this fully supported by uh, Senate Education? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Totally and enthusiastically. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and this, this is the language and uh, we put it together, I'd put it together back in uh, early June. So you will notice on this bill and the same theme will come up with the others that we're looking at today. Um, when we get to the effective date section, we'll need to make some changes um, because we have effective dates that reflect a July 1st, 2020 effective date. That's already passed. So we'll need to pick another date. Um, but this is the amendment. So it would just strike out section 11, the effective dates of the bill as it came over from the house 
but not make any other changes to the substance there. And then uh, as Senator Ingram had highlighted, this is the first group of sections is on school wellness. It amends the definition of wellness program in an existing statute um, to first tie into the definition of comprehensive health education, which is, um, which is addressed a bit in the underlying bill. Um, so a wellness program is a program that includes comprehensive health education, as well as fitness and nutrition. Um, it has the secretary and it takes out a requirement that there be approval of the state board. The secretary establishes this advisory council on wellness and comprehensive health that would include at least three members with expertise in health services, health education, or health policy. It would have the members serving without compensation and um, eliminates language on receiving actual expenses. Um, the council would assist the agency to plan, coordinate, and encourage wellness and comprehensive health programs in public schools. And this would add a requirement that it meet not less than twice a year. Subsection C adds, uh, in addition to agencies and councils working on childhood wellness, that the secretary would also collaborate with other officials. And then it adds in a specific reference to the director of trauma prevention and resilience development and the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. Um, and then make some terminology changes and eliminates language on creating a process for schools to share with the health department information about height and weight of students in kindergarten. Although I think you may have heard testimony that, that some of this information um, may be getting provided in, or collected in other ways. Section 12, would specify that on or before January 15th, the Agency of Education in collaboration with the Advisory Council on Wellness and Comprehensive Health, that council we just talked about, must update and distribute to school districts a model wellness po program policy using that expanded definition of wellness program that we looked at that must be in compliance with all relevant state and federal laws and reflect nationally accepted best practices for comprehensive health education and school wellness policies, such as guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's whole school, whole community, whole child model. So those are the two sections on wellness programs. And then section 13 would add a new statutory section on menstrual hygiene products starts out by saying that by enacting the statute, the General Assembly intends to ensure that a female student attending a public school or an approved independent school has access to menstrual hygiene products at no cost and without the embarrassment of having to request them. Then requires a school district and an approved independent school to make menstrual hygiene products available at no cost in a majority of gender neutral bathrooms and bathrooms designated for females that are generally used by females in any of grades five through 12 in each school within the district or under the jurisdiction of the board of the independent school. It would have the school district or independent school in consultation with the school nurse who provides services to that school, determine which of the gender neutral bathrooms and bathrooms designated for females to stock with menstrual hygiene products and which brands to use. And it specifies that the school districts and approved independent schools would bear the cost of supplying the menstrual hygiene products and that they may seek grants or partner with a nonprofit or community-based organization to fulfill the obligation. Then it goes back in and does some effective dates. So for the most part, it, it um, in sub, what is now subsection A, it pulls in um, effective dates from the, the underlying bill. Uh, it has section 13 take effect on July 1st, 2020, which of course we, we need to revisit um, and would have school districts and approved independent schools comply with the requirements of that section for the 2021-22 school year. So not this school year, but the next school year. And thereafter, the remainder takes effect on July 1st, 2020. Again, we should revisit. And that is the end of the amendment. So just uh, can we stick with the effective dates for just a minute? Sure. So sections one, seven, uh, and eight, those are refer to access to contraception. So those actually refer to, and this is a, a 
piece we should um, revisit as well. Those relate to uh, pharmacists prescribing of self-administered co hormonal contraceptives. And as you recall, there was some overlap with what was happening in the OPR bill, which as I understand is now in, uh, I, well, I don't remember where it is. It was in finance. Um, okay. So there needs to, at some point there needs to be um, some decisions made more broadly about what is going to pass this year in the way of pharmacists prescribing. So if the OPR bill goes through, it does almost all of what this bill does. The only difference is just the section one of this bill addresses um, health insurance coverage for contraceptives when they are prescribed by a pharmacist. So it pulls in that concept of the, um, the pharmacist prescribing that's not, I don't believe, in the OPR bill um, because it, it's more on the insurance side, but the pharmacist prescribing itself is in the OPR bill. So if the OPR bill is going through, then you don't need, and, and in fact, it's confusing and a little bit um, internally <clears throat> conflicting to have these provisions as well. Okay, um, well, so OPR, uh, we'll have to hear from um, Senator Cummings about the OPR bill and where it may be. It's out. It is out, okay. Hello? It's out? Yeah, we did that. I'll give you your... There you go. I'll, I will double check, but no, it's out because we had two of them. Um, Yes, I will look right now. I hadn't looked. Things got, things got put on other bills, but they're all out to the best of my knowledge. I think that's okay. probably true. So, yes, it is, in, it is in the House now. Thank you. Okay. And which yeah. committee is it in? Is... <laughs> it's in the Government Operations Committee. It's, a, it's all part of the larger OPR bill. All right. Um, I, I guess that who... Um, the question is then, what do we do given the, where it is? I would like to have us move this bill forward as much as possible. And I'm thinking that given that we're adding this proposal amendment, it right. will require some consideration on the part of the House Human Services Committee. I, I, I don't know that they've actually, um, taken testimony on this, and I'm looking at Teresa and Dan, Representative Noyes and Representative Wood. I don't know if you've take, looked at this proposal at all, for the amendment that Senator Ingram and Jen were talking about. Oh, should we raise our hands, or how do we do that? No, no, go ahead. I, yeah, I, it's fine. <laughs> There's fewer of us. We're small, and we have a very small group. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't believe that we have seen this language. No, okay. and I have not walked through it with them. Okay. No. So, um, and so I think what we might do is to have language that's as close as we can to whatever OPR is. I'm not uncomfortable with what we do have right now. Um, I hate to send another problem over to Representative Pugh, but I don't think it's a big problem. I think it's a matter of coordination, so. Right, and we had, when I'd worked on this bill with the, <laughs> with the Human Services Committee back in the spring, um, they were aware of the potential for conflict and it seemed too early in the process to be trying to, to resolve that. So I don't think it will be a surprise to them um, that this issue needs to be addressed. Okay. But so I just made myself a note to follow up with the chair. Oh, thank you. Sure. Excellent. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we leave this bill for now? And then, uh, Senator Ingwin, go ahead. Sorry, just one other small point. Should we um, should we change the title of the bill to? Yeah. Can we do that? We certainly can like? change the title. We also should should look at what date. Um, just so you know. So far, I've been mostly changing July 1st effective dates to be November 1st. Um, just it seems like it's about as far out as you usually have from the end of the session to allow time for the governor to sign the bill and for it to become an act before that effective date has passed. So if that works for you, I will I can um, change the July 1st, 2020 dates to November 1st, 2020 dates. OK, and Senator McCormick. 
Yeah, this might be a question for uh, Senator Ingram uh, more, but I just, uh, I just want to verify that this is not on the hygiene issues. This is not already the case. I want to make no, sure we're not. It's not. We're we're not did, we took testimony. testimony. You took testimony that this is not oh, already yeah. the case. Okay. That's right. Yeah. I'm surprised. I'm surprised at that. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, it, there, you know, there might be machines in some like high school bathrooms, but like yeah. generally they don't work and, <laughs> and they cost money and they still cost money. Yeah. And stuff. It seems like yeah, such no. obvious common sense. Uh, okay. yeah, and we talk to school nurses. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. So unless I hear Ann, Senator Cummings. I just, has anyone talked to the schools? I'm just thinking of everything the schools are dealing with now. Um, stores don't have dressing rooms. I don't, you know, it, has anyone asked them if this is something they can deal with at this point? Well, we took testimony earlier in, in the year uh, and everybody felt it was a very minimal sort of requirement. Um, I mean, I guess it is true we haven't, you know, education didn't go back and talk to them since, you know, very recently. Um, but I don't... So I do need to clarify the, the um, menstrual hygiene requirement, um, product requirement is for next school year, but the contraceptive requirement in the underlying bill would apply to this year. So that's really the, so I think Senator Cummings question is relevant, um, but it applies more to the, the provision of, contra of condoms than to menstrual hygiene. Okay, products. yeah, that, all right. That's probably not a big stretch, okay. Okay, okay with yep. that then. All right, so the November date works for the first part of the bill. Okay, so why don't we then uh, hold this uh, hold this aside, and we'll come back to it um, as soon as we can on our, on our agenda. I think we're probably ready to have a um, short discussion and vote on the bill once we see the dates in place, and once we hear back. Um, Jen, you're going to talk with Representative Pugh, so that will be very helpful. Yes, I'm, I will follow up with her and I'll copy you so that Excellent. everyone is part of the same conversation. Excellent, thank you. Okay, that's good. Um, amazing what you remember when you actually get back to re trying to remember. <laughs> uh, yes, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> huh? It, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> I know, it's great, it's good. Uh, so, I know, I know all. I know all of Wally Cleaver's friends' names. <laughs> <laughs> Just buried in there, Charlie. <laughs> That's Wolfie scary, Robert. Senator. That's scary. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on to um, the Older Vermonters Act. And I think before we go through the bill, we should ask uh, Representative Noyes and Representative Wood of Human Services to introduce the bill to us and thank you for being with us this morning. Well, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, thank you, Senator, Noyes. thanks for having us. Yes, we, we are um, delighted and extremely appreciative of um, your committees taking up this bill. Um, mm -hmm. This is uh, something that's been in the works now for over two years and uh, Dan will talk a little bit more about the process that we use to get here. Uh, H611, we really felt in the House that this was an important bill prior to COVID and uh, the current pandemic has uh, shown with a huge magnifying glass how incredibly important this bill is right now and into the future. Um, we, we see that there is significant improvement needed across state government, not just in the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. Um, we can see as an example, the um, Emergency Response Center after encountering um, you know, some spread of the disease in long-term care facilities realized uh, pretty quickly, luckily here in Vermont, that they needed a different approach for older Vermonters who were vulnerable and uh, a different approach than the um, general population approach. And that wasn't evident, that hadn't been planned for in that way. 
And so um, this bill really talks about all of state government and our communities. It's not just the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. Um, it also talks about uh, <laughs> promoting healthy aging and for people to stay independent as long as possible. Those are things that we want to strive for here in Vermont and we do a good job at it, um, but we can always improve on those areas. Um, the other thing that I did wanna point out is that um, there are a couple of features of this bill um, that are uh, critical, frankly. Um, and one of those features uh, is the development and the study by the Division of Rate Setting of the methodology that we currently use to pay our uh, private providers. And as, as you probably well know, um, they, during this pandemic, they have been uh, particularly uh, hurt. They're, they're mostly small. They're mostly um, you know, organizations that rely to a great extent on volunteers as well as, as uh, paid staff. And uh, for instance, in Rutland and in um, central Vermont, uh, two of our adult day centers have already closed, uh, having succumbed to the financial impacts of the pandemic. Um, those are vital services that help keep Vermonters at home with their families for as long as possible and avoiding you know, more costly out of home care. And so we have long struggled in our state to understand uh, or to address the issues facing that group of providers. And uh, the, to their credit, the Division of Rate Setting is undertaking uh, numerous studies across the Agency of Human Services. And um, this bill would add this group of providers to their list. And um, they have testified, we, we did, uh, because of the pandemic, we did uh, put out the date required for the reporting back. Uh, we pushed that out a little bit um, in the bill that passed the House. And um, so they are ready, willing, and able to do that. Um, the other thing that this bill does is to uh, include a study committee to examine the issue of self-neglect in older Vermonters. Uh, it's an issue that crops its head up on a periodic basis and Frankly, we don't really have a lot in state statute um, dealing with it. And it's a complicated issue. It's an extremely complicated issue. Uh, uh, and uh, so with that, um, there is a group formed um, to pick up essentially where the last group left off because there was a previous group a few years back. Um, and it puts that requirement for a report back to us. Um, it pushes that out a little bit. Um, but that is, is uh, a critical piece of this as well. The other main reporting piece is the Division of Licensing and Protection. Um, for those of you who were here a few years back, um, you may recall that uh, they had been sued, the department had been sued because of, um, I, I think it, essentially it was the ability um, of the staff at the time to uh, investigate sufficient number of complaints and su the substantiation rates and all, all of that kind of stuff. There was a settlement agreed to um, that required certain reporting. Um, that uh, reporting in statute was in session law and was not in, uh, in the green books. And so what you will see in here about reporting of adult abuse is something that the department is currently doing, um, but we felt that it was important enough that it should be in state law. So um, with that, what I am going to do is to turn it over to Dan to tell you a little bit about the process that we have um, gone through to get to the point where we are. Yeah, good morning and thank you. Um, thanks for having us here today and thanks for taking up 611. It's glad to see it's uh, moving here. So uh, yeah, we started this in uh, 2018. Um, we passed the bill. The, um, Older Vermont study group to help draft this um, kind of the, the blueprint for creating this legislation and we met for 30 of us met for like 18 months um, and really went through all of um, what it what is what does successful aging look like in Vermont and what do we need to do uh, within state government to make sure we have a comprehensive system of services and supports for older Vermonters to age um, 
have the ability to age with dignity, respect, and independence. So um, we had everybody had a seat at the table. It was some great conversations over that time. And then Teresa and I took that report that um, came out of Dale. They did a great job on it. And we were able to work with uh, Jen Carby and, and draft some legislation that um, we ran uh, within our committee and the Human Services Committee. And then, um, then we had our break and we came back to it and really brought in some uh, issues that have come up during COVID as Teresa was talking about. Um, you know, a couple other things in there that I think are really um, gonna be important to see move forward is a master plan on aging, which the SCAN Foundation gave a presentation to uh, both our committees on. Um, and also um, we're moving towards an age-friendly state designation. Um, I think these will really, um, really help the department and um, our communities work together as we're gonna see one in four of us are gonna be over the age of 65. So um, thank you for having us here and thanks for taking it up. Really appreciate it. No, thank you. I, I, I certainly appreciate the length of time that you have spent in fine tuning the work. I know it's been a, a lot of effort on your part and we really appreciate it. Um, so thank you for bringing us this. I know that the um, I I had met separately with the person from Scan on the uh, master plan, and I think that her suggestions have offered improvement. So that's great, and everything that you said is so absolutely key. So we'll, I gee, I don't know. Uh, sounds like it's a bill that we're going to have to take up. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be moving on. Um, Good news. Thank well, you. Well, you know, the one, I do have a question for you both, and that is, as you're talking about um, moving Vermont to become an age-friendly state, one of the criticisms that we hear consistently about Vermont is that we take money away from our older population, that we have, a, we're a high-tax state. And I just want to know if there was any conversation at all between you and Ways and Means uh, Committee uh, regarding the effect of taxation on older Vermonters. We, no. we did not address that issue, Madam Chair. No, okay. but that is the, that's the type of discussions that's going to come up in a master plan on aging, um, where we look at how um, property taxes and access to uh, housing um, be improved. Okay, I mean, I think it's uh, I think it is absolutely wor a worthwhile conversation. Everything that you mm -hmm. have said uh, is also a worthwhile conversation. Providers at home, uh, self neglect. I know how difficult that is, um, and I and I think so. Is there anything in the bill that would direct the group to having the conversation regarding financial security? Um, it doesn't specifically state that, um, but I, I agree with Representative Noyes that that would be the in, intention um, of a master plan on aging to address financial security, to address accessibility of our communities, to address health care. Um, you know, we talk about uh, community streets being wide enough. Uh, there, 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 there's a, a saying that people use that you can you can roll the walker just the same as you can roll a baby carriage and you need good <laughs> sidewalks to do both of those. Um, it, it just <laughs> takes a few more seconds. <laughs> yeah, a little you bit need 20 yeah. instead of 16, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and we, so and we, that's the intent of bringing this, um, the making the secretary of administration responsible for convening um, this plan because that will give it the, um, the, the breadth and the depth of all of state government. Mm -hmm. okay. in, some of the conceptual part, in some of the conceptual parts of the bill, we do talk about adequate income and, uh, and income of older Vermonters, so. Okay, that is Good. one of the right, That is one of the rights. I, thank you, Dan, for um, remembering that, yes. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll keep our eyes open for that, P appreciate it. Uh, any other uh, questions for Representative Noyes or Representative Wood? Wow, thank you. 
<laughs> well, well, we're well, always did, available. Can I yeah. ask? Can I ask? Did you both present the bill on the floor? Yes, we did. Yes. You shared yep. it. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Good to know. Thank you. All right. Um, so, Jen, uh, why don't you take us through the bill briefly, and so we can see what what we're talking about. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, it's a 25 page bill. So how much detail do you want to go into? Uh, I think let's do um, the, not the 10,000, but maybe the 5,000 foot level. Uh, let, let's go through as at a fairly high level, I think. And then if we, we can come back and ask questions. And I know okay. we'll, we're, we're gonna be hearing testimony about the bill, so why don't we just do a a big flyover? Sure. Would you like me to put it up on the screen? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen now? Terrific. Great. All right. So this is H six eleven, and it's an act relating to the Older Vermonters Act. Um, it starts out with a uh, by adding a new chapter in Title 33 called Older Vermonters Act, and I'll specifying it can be cited as the Older Vermonters Act. Then it has um, some principles of a system of services, supports, and protections for older Vermonters, um, and it has the state adopting principles for a comprehensive and coordinated system of services and supports for older Vermonters. So I'll just name these and you can look at the language in each of them, um, or we can go through them at a later time. So the, the um, principles deal with self-determination, safety and protection, coordinated and efficient system of services, financial security, optimal health and wellness, social connection and engagement, housing, transportation and community design, family caregiver support, and that's the last one, family caregiver support. Then we have a number of definitions that get used throughout the uh, chapter. Many of them will be familiar. Some of them are new, um, but I won't take you through the details of the definitions at the moment. Um, then we can get. I, in, can I oh, ask one question? Sure. Uh, on the older American, uh, older older American Act. Just going back to that. Actual older Americans Act. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, do is there is there a continuous financial uh, investment at, from the feds to the states uh, as a result of this act and. And what does it go to? Do you know off just off the cuff? Uh, no, but I think one of your later witnesses, um, okay. Angela Smith Jang from Dale, could probably answer that for you either uh, now we'll, or we'll later. We'll go back to that. Okay, good. Right. That's so Angela, a heads up for Angela. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. So then we get into um, new section 6204. This is the duties of the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, Dale. Um, and it says it's the, de the state's designated state unit on aging um, and it sets the department as the subject matter expert to guide decision-making in state government for all programs, services, funding, initiatives, and other activities relating to or affecting older Vermonters. Um, and one of the pieces that was added in, in, in the house side is you'll see at the bottom of the page here, uh, public health crisis and emergency preparedness planning. So this has um, in, inserts, make sure that Dale is included in that process of um, public health crisis and emergency preparedness planning as it results to older Vermonters. Um, once we get once we get health and welfare raised above the bottom of the planning process, we'll be all set. Um, right. Goes through some other provisions on that. Talks about the area agencies on aging and their duties, and uh, I think you'll be hearing from Vermont's AAAs. Um, from Janet Hunt in a bit, but it talks about um, the role of the area agencies on aging and their um, requirements, both things that they do and, and um, kind of uh, highlighting their role 
in the system of services and supports for older Vermonters. Um, and it, it gives them some additional duties around promoting the principles, promoting collaboration, um, facilitating awareness, things like that. The next section requires Dale to adopt a state plan on aging, which they're already required to do, but it, it set some of this into state statute and put some additional provisions into it. So this is the plan for a comprehensive and coordinated system of services, supports and protections. So at least once every four years, Dale must adopt a state plan on aging, uh, must be consistent with those principles near the beginning of the chapter um, and give some categories that must be included, priorities for continuation of existing programs and development of new programs, criteria for receiving services or funding, the types of services provided, and a process for evaluating and assessing each program's success. It talks about how the commissioner will determine the priorities for the state plan on aging. Um, it has the department considering, considering the uh, of funds available after determining the priorities and gives a process for um, including the Dale Advisory Board in developing the plan. Um, and then it would have by January 15th, the department, uh, January 15th of each year, has the department reporting to this committee as well as the House Committee and the Governor on implementation of the plan, the extent to which the system principles are being achieved, the extent to which the system has been successful in targeting services to individuals with the greatest economic and social need, and those terms are defined. The sufficiency of the provider network and workforce challenges affecting providers of care or services for older Vermonters and the afford availability of affordable and accessible opportunities for older Vermonters to engage with their communities. So that's the end of the new chapter on the Older Vermonters Act. Then the next section is, uh, as Representative Wood was describing, this Adult Protective Services Program reporting um, requirement. And this sets in statute really the report types of reporting that the APS program is doing now, but it sets it out in statute and uh, requires it to continue. So this would have by January 15th of each year, the department again report Dale reporting to this committee and the House Human Services Committee regarding the department's adult protective services activities during the previous fiscal year. And then it has a lot of um, additional information uh, or, or details about uh, all of the information that needs to be reported. So this goes on for quite a while. I won't take you through the details of it, but maybe something you want to revisit. Um, the next is the section on the Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well. So this is what Representative Noyes was describing. This um, really just talks first about the development process um, so how they're going to put together this Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well. Um, and, and this has the Secretary of Administration in collaboration with the commissioners of Dale and of Health propose a process for developing the Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well to be implemented across state government, local government, the private sector, and philanthropies. Um, it talks about what this Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well would include, but this is really um, setting up the, the process for, um, or set, setting up the framework for developing the process, and then the process will inform the plan. Um, so the first thing you're getting back is just the process, and it requires the secretary to engage a broad array of Vermonters with an interest in creating an age-friendly Vermont, and then, submitting to this committee and House Human Services by May 1st, the proposed process for developing the Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well, including action steps and an achievable timeline, as well as potential performance measures to use in evaluating the results of implementing the action plan uh, and the relevant outcomes set forth as far as um, results-based accountability goes and related indicators to which the action plan should relate. 
Next is uh, the evaluation of the Medicaid rates for home and community-based service providers. You'll see sections four and five were deleted. This was through the appropriations process in um, consultation with the Human Services Committee. So the outcome of this then is looking at um, the provider rates for the home and community-based service provider network. Um, so first it defines home and community-based services as long-term services and supports received in a home or community setting other than a nursing home under choices for care uh, and includes home health and hospice services, assistive community care services, and enhanced residential care services. It directs the uh, DIVA and Dale to conduct a rate study of the Medicaid reimbursement rates provide, provided to, or paid to the providers of home and community-based services and to look at their adequacy and the methodologies underlying the rates. And then it would have the departments determine the Medicaid reimbursement rates for these providers that are sufficient to recruit and retain individual service providers and allow consumers to attain and maintain their highest level of functioning in accordance with the care plan, while also creating a fair and equitable balance between cost containment and high quality care. Uh, establish a predictable schedule for Medicaid rates and rate updates. Identify ways to align the Medicaid reimbursement method for these home and community-based service providers with those of other payers to the extent that those methodologies and rates exist, limit the number of methodological exceptions and communicate the proposed changes to the providers before implementing them. And it has Diva and Dale develop criteria and a process for calculating an annual inflation factor. So originally the bill had had an annual inflation factor that would be applied. This is having them develop criteria and process for calculating an annual inflation factor for potential application to Medicaid rates for these providers in future fiscal years. Um, but it doesn't actually apply the inflation factor. And then it would have by April 15th, the department's report to um, this committee and the Human Services Committee and the Appropriations Committees, the results of their rate study and the criteria and process for calculating the inflation factor. So again, this is setting up, this is looking at the adequacy of the rates and, um, and identifying a potential way to apply an inflation factor, but it does not actually apply the inflation factor or change any rates. So there is no fiscal, you'll hear from Nolan at some point, but there is no immediate fiscal impact. Section seven is the self-neglect working group. So this creates a self-neglect working group to provide recommendations regarding adults who due to physical or mental impairment or diminished capacity are unable to perform essential self-care tasks. And it uses the same definition of self-neglect as in, sorry, as in the uh, Older Vermonters Act chapter. It gives the list of members. There are uh, a number of members, 16 members, I believe, unless there was a two somewhere, um, including a few consumers. Um, and you'll see near the end, those are the only um, participants who receive a per diem. Um, it directs the working group to consider issues and develop recommendations relating to self-neglect, including um, how to identify adults who live in Vermont and who are self-neglecting, how prevalent self-neglect is among Vermont adults, um, what resources and services currently exist to help Vermonters who are self-neglecting and whether that could be improved, what additional resources and services are needed to better assist Vermonters who are self-neglecting, how to prevent self-neglect and ident identify those at risk for self-neglect, and whether the definition provided in the Older Vermonters Act is consistent with the principles of self-determination elsewhere in Vermont law. Uh, has the report coming back by July 1st, 2022. So this is one of those deadlines that Representative Wood mentioned that they, the House pushed out in uh, recognition of, pushed later in recognition of uh, all of the work that's going on to address the current pandemic. But by July 1st, 2022, 
the working group would report its findings and recommendations for both legislative and non-legislative action to this committee and the House Human Services Committee. It talks about how the meetings work and has the consumer members of the working group eligible to or entitled to receive per diem compensation and reimbursement. Others do not receive that. Um, and then finally, the effective date, this one we don't have to change unless you want to, uh, has the act taking effect on passage, except that the plan, the new plan for comprehensive and coordinated system of services, supports and protections would apply with um, the next state plan on aging, the state plan on aging taking effect on October 1st, 2022 under the federal timeline. So that- There's a lot there. Yes, that's yeah. the bill. I have, I just, just briefly, um, I, I, I think that we'll get the answer to my questions, but I'm gonna ask the questions now. Uh, uh, when we have testimonies, I'm hoping there'll be some. Uh, so I asked one, I asked about financial. The other one is why nursing homes were excluded um, when we were talking about community-based services. And then my other question will be, because we went through it quickly and I don't remember from when I've read it the last time, uh, the definition of self-neglect. Uh, and then I have another question and that is, um, there is a lot of work in here for Dale, commissioner, but then we're also looking to reduce the silo effect through state government and what is the relationship between the commissioner and the secretary of administration in accomplishing all this work? And I know that's along with the other folks, uh, nonprofits, so on. Those will be some of my questions. I see Representative Noyes is shaking his head. He's probably thought of some of these already, but um, so good. Uh, hold you your thought, but go, go ahead. Who was that? That was, well, that was me. Do you want me to address any of the, either the looking, I can sure. pull up the definition of self-neglect, if that's helpful. I think the first question I heard uh, was why nursing homes were not included in the home and community-based services. I think uh, given our, our usual use of the term home and community-based services, nursing homes are not um, based either in the home or the, or the community in the sense that people live in the nursing home. They're not in their homes and receiving services either in their home or in the community, okay. but returning to their homes. So there okay. is a whole, there's a whole step, very large statutory and regulatory framework for um, a, adjusting and increasing the rates for nursing homes under Medicaid. It's set up in statute and um, and has an extensive rule um, as well that sets that up. And and there's a whole division of rate setting um, that addresses just that. There is not a similar um, analogous unit for home and community-based service providers, nor is there anything in statute that, that affects their rates. Good. Representative okay. Wood is, has you. something that's, to say as well. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wood. I just wanted to um, mention that um, also the, um, the feds um, define nursing homes as institutional-based services um, versus home and community-based services. And as, uh, as um, Ledge Council just talked about, uh, pr one of the primary reasons for this distinction in this bill is that there is already a uh, statute and regulatory process for providing um, a review of the costs of nursing homes. Good, thank you. All right. Do you want me to put up the definition of self-neglect? To um, look sure. at before well, you continue. Let's look at that briefly, and okay. then um, we'll hear from our begin to hear from our witnesses. Okay. So the definition of self neglect that would be added for the older Vermonters Act um, chapter, and then pulled in for the self neglect working group, defines self neglect as an adult's inability due to physical or mental impairment or diminished capacity to perform essential self care tasks including obtaining essential food, clothing, shelter, and medical care, obtaining goods and services necessary to maintain physical health, mental health, or general safety, 
or managing one's own financial affairs. And then it specifies that the term self-neglect excludes individuals who make a conscious and voluntary choice not to provide for certain basic needs as a matter of lifestyle, personal preference, or religious belief, and who understand the consequences of their decisions. Okay, good. Yes, now I remember reading that. I remember the, especially the second section, so that's helpful. All right. Okay. Um, good. And we'll go, I think what we'll do is let's, Let's hear from uh, everyone who is testifying today and then we can, I know that there are other folks who are going to be critical to, um, to the bill. I, I know that the attorney general's office is very interested in testifying and we'll get them in um, and others. And then we as a committee will have to review the language of the bill and see what changes, if any, we want to uh, put in. So. Um, ah, we have Angela Smith Ding here, Director of Adult Services from Dale. It's good to see you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, for the record, I'm Angela Smith Jang, Director of the Adult Services Division at Dale. Um, first, uh, I want to address your question, Senator Lyons, about the Older Americans Act and the funding um, and services. <clears throat> so yes, there is ongoing federal investment um, in OAA services for Vermont. So annually, Vermont receives about $7 million in federal OAA funding. Um, and that primarily goes to services for people over the age of 60 in community through, it goes, the funding goes through Dale to the Area Agencies on Aging and out to providers providing the services. So for example, meals, home delivered meals and congregate meals, also case management, transportation, legal services, information and assistance, health promotion, disease prevention, family caregiver support, a whole host of those kinds of um, programs primarily to support older Vermonters staying independent in community. Have is we that seen? Helpful? Yes, it is. It's very helpful, and um, I think we're all aware of of the support, but not how much and the extent to which it is used. the The other the question that I have is, what if any increases have we seen in that coming from the federal government over time? I know there's always pressure on us to add funding in the budget. Um, it, has the federal government had, is there a CPI or any kind of uh, regular increase attached to the, these dollars? Not. There, there is not a regular increase attached. Um, each time the OAA is reauthorized at the federal level, um, when it's reauthorized, there's a recommended increase um, to that funding, but it's subject to appropriation each year. Um, and that's been hit or miss over time. It, it certainly hasn't increased um, as our aging population has increased to the to the same extent. So um, Janet could speak more from the triple A's, but um, the funding has pretty has has not increased significantly, I would say, um, over the last five to 10 years. Okay. Uh, and so it's not a per capita type of uh, appropriation. It's just a flat appropriation dependent on what our congressional delegation can advocate for. <laughs> the, yes, to, to some extent, yes. And, and um, then among the 50 states, it's divided by a formula based on the population of okay. each state. Okay. So as one of the top older states in the country, we should be getting a higher something if it, yes, if that was taken into account in the formula, yes. Okay. <laughs> but okay. Um, generally, Vermont receives a small state minimum because our population is so much smaller than other states. Okay. Thank you for that. I mean, and at every step that you take, you find there's more to, to learn. So that's true. That's true. Uh, why um, don't you? I ask you this, Angela, do you have your testimony or could we get your testimony in writing? 
Yes, I'm um, following following the meeting. I'm happy to send it in writing. Perfect. That would be helpful because uh, we do have pretty specific questions that I think are going to be helpful for folks to know as we go through the bill. Great. Yes, right. will do. Go ahead. Um, I don't want to, I'll try not to, we will try not to interrupt your flow. It's okay. If you need to ask questions along the way, that, that, that's no problem. Okay. Um, so Dale, overall, we're very supportive of H611 um, and very appreciative of the extensive work put into it to date, you know, beginning with the Older Vermonters Act Working Group in 2018 um, that worked to develop the recommendations for the bill and then all the way through its passage in the House. Um, from our perspective, Section 6206, the principles of the system of support services and protections for older Vermonters, that's really the heart and soul of the bill in many ways. These were developed collaboratively in the working group over that year and a half that we met. And together, the principles outline a really positive vision for collective action around the work we do and the Vermont we're trying to build for all of us as we age. So at Dale, we're eager to use these principles, which really strengthen our mission as we strive to serve all, all Vermonters. The section on the state plan on aging the ex expands our work on the state plan on aging, which we're all, as, um, as has been said, we're already required to develop every four years for the Older Americans Act work, but this expands it to include not only OAA, but also our long-term services and supports work, and in particular, choices for care. So our next state plan on aging will include a really comprehensive review of our system of services and supports for older Vermonters across the spectrum of, of support and need. So from meals and programs at senior centers, all the way through to high levels of, of care need, for, for example, for those living in deme with dementia in our communities. So we'll incorporate these new elements um, into our next state plan on aging, which was, um, as was said, will begin October 2022. And we've already begun the needs assessment process. We have to start that a couple of years ahead. Um, and we've begun the needs assessment and we'll be asking older Vermonters, family caregivers, and stakeholders key questions that will help address some of the elements that are talked about in this section of the bill. <clears throat> so section two about the adult protective services providing an annual report to the legislature. So as was noted, it's important to note, this isn't part of the Older Vermonters Act, but um, modifies the APS statute. And Dale is uh, supportive of the report since APS is already submitting this, in, this information voluntarily to the legislature. So it just makes it a yearly requirement in statute and we're happy to continue to do that. Um, section three sets forth the process for the creation of the Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well, similar to California's Master Plan on Aging. Um, and this will really be a blueprint for moving our state forward in a way that embraces and celebrates aging and older Vermonters. And we look forward to collaborating on a proposal for developing the action plan with AOA and Department of Health. You know, for a few years now um, with Department of Health, um, we've been exploring the idea of seeking to make Vermont a designated age-friendly state. And I think this effort will really move us forward towards that goal. Um, the challenge may be timing. The proposals due May 1st, uh, 2021. Given the intense focus on COVID-19 by all three of our agencies um, and not knowing how long that focus will really need to be maintained on COVID, we're concerned we're not necessarily gonna be able to work on this proposal and give it the time and energy that's needed so perhaps um, our later deadline would be valuable. Um, regarding section six, the home and community-based rate study and the inflation factor and report, Dale is also supportive of this work. We recognize this is much needed and long overdue within our service system for the sustainability of our provider network. Um, and we will support DIVA through this effort. 
Um, again, I'm not sure <clears throat> about the timing and the feasibility of the timing given the intense workload at DIVA related to COVID-19 at DIVA and Dale. Um, but I would defer to, to DIVA as the lead on that work about um, the, that timeline. And then finally, section seven, the self-neglect work group and report. One of the original recommendations of the Older Vermonters Act working group was that the state seek to better address self-neglect. You know, it's a complex issue. And Dale is very supportive of the work and the task we're given um, as a group to develop this report to seek to understand the causes better, the prevalence, the resources, and prevention. You know, Vermont's one of only a few states that doesn't address self-neglect in statute. And our community-based agencies, the AAAs, the DAs, everyone is doing great work in trying to support individuals that are identified as self-neglecting, but the issue's growing and it needs more systemic focus. So our hope is that this work um, towards this report will guide us forward in a more proactive way. And with the due date being July 1st, 2022, we're, we believe that'll give us um, the work group enough time to really develop a thorough report for the legislature. So I think, um, I think that's what I wanted to touch on and um, appreciate the opportunity to testify and happy to answer any particular questions. Okay, uh, questions for Angela. Uh, Senator Ingram, you're muted, no, you're not. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Angela. Um, I was just wondering, especially in light of um, COVID, if um, there's a particular concern around food security for older Vermonters, and I, I don't, um, I don't see uh, anything jumping out at me that specifically mentions uh, that. Although I suppose broadly in the principles, it is probably included. But it, do you think there's any? need for us to, um, you know, address that more uh, specifically in this, in this bill or? That's a great question. Yeah, I think um, food, food security is um, kind of an embedded in the principles, both under sort of the financial security umbrella and under health and wellness. Um, and our, our, our system of providing um, good nutrition for older Vermonters during the pandemic has definitely been been pushed. Um, um, but our, you know, um, as as Janet can testify to as well, the AAAs and the senior centers and meal providers really stepped up and have been um, serving a lot more people and a lot more meals during the pandemic, trying to reach all of those folks who had to who've been staying home and need that support. Um, and there's been the additional Families First and CARES Act funding that has been uh, provided for nutrition, as well as some uh, CRF as well. Um, so I think in the immediate, the, the need is, um, is fulfilled, but we know that hunger in older Vermonters is a significant issue. So. Um, I always think that there's room for improvement in, in reaching people with, with good nutrition in um, new and creative ways. Mm -hmm. I think it actually uh, can be a factor in the self, in the self neglect. Uh, I, I know in my yes. experience in working as a pastor, you know, I, I've seen older folks um, through the years not be able to, to, you know, get the, assistance they need with being able to, to find food and meals. And it's um, sometimes they just kind of give up. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Anyway, I might think about maybe, I mean, maybe offering a little more specific language, Madam Chair, uh, about, about that specifically. But. Well, this is good. Keep track of, of your ideas as we go forward, because, you know, I'm trying to do the same thing. And then when we go through the bill, um, we may find that we would like to make some, uh, slight additions and, and changes. If not that I would suspect that human services has thought about this as if others, <laughs> uh, but if it might be important to have um, some specific language. So good, do that. That's great. Okay, thank you. Other questions committee? 
Okay. So Teresa, uh, did you, I, I know that you want to make, did you want to make a comment now or I, I'm going to, I'm going to try and hold it to the Senate at this point, unless you have That's good. some, okay. All right, good. I, I was just going to, I was just going to uh, uh, point to the uh, areas that uh, reference uh, food security or insecurity. So that right. they, there is reference yeah. in the bill. We'll get it. No, so that's good. No, thank you. And um, thank so as we as we jot down our ideas, and then when we go through the bill, will the your language will pop out at us, and we can decide whether we like it or whether we want to improve it. If we can, we know we can't always improve your language. Yeah. Okay, Senator McCormick. I I appreciate the uh, the curmudgeon protections in there. You know, in other words, if someone has chosen something and they know what they're doing. Um, but I, I did notice, uh, or unless I missed it, I didn't hear a mention of of uh, hygiene of people who are neglecting uh, personal hygiene, which to me would indicate not made a, perhaps a lost ability to pay attention. What? Why is that not in there? Angela, do you want to speak to that while you're uh, on the hotspot? That's a good question um, because we do see that as um, as a piece um, or a potential um, area of self neglect. So I'll have to the definition um, that was included in this was developed by a self neglect task force that um, formed and did a report in 2012 looking at self neglect. So we used that definition as the foundation here. Um, but it basic basic needs around health may it may be trying may be embedded in there, but we you know there's the potential we could be more explicit um, around hygiene. Yeah. But yeah. No, that's a good point. It, it may be around yeah. health and personal hygiene uh, as a combo. Uh, keep yeah. that, Senator. Keep okay. that thought. Thanks. Good. Yeah. I, I mean, I've certainly seen it in uh folks that i've been i've dealt with yeah uh, any other questions for angela all right uh so we have uh the director of from Senator cummings is waving her her hand rather <laughs> oh excuse me <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh, we Full disclosure, I worked in an adult day, uh, one of them that has been closed. And I know a lot of the self neglect, the, the, the food, a, a lot of the depression that leads to that were dealt with by adult days. And I'm wondering, is there a plan to open the ones that were closed? They were in fairly large, you know, met metro. Vermont metropolitan areas um, and, uh, and to expand that because that was a way that you really got to people before the problem got to be too severe. Um, that's a great question, Senator Cummings. And I would say that a plan is in is in development at this point. Um, you know, Dale um, has a process for approving an, an, a new adult day, but has generally not had to go out and um, find an organization who wants to start a new adult day, especially during a, a pandemic when the future is unknown. So it's a little bit of a tricky process right now, but there is an, in, like, for example, in, in both Barrie and Rutland, there are organizations that are interested in exploring the option. And we've also pulled in the AAAs in those regions kind of as uh, facilitators to help explore that with some different providers. So those conversations are happening actually this week, next week. Um, and, and there is a process to, to then start an adult day if we find an entity that's really interested in doing that. that that's great because they really do good work, but it, finances were always a struggle. Absolutely. So, okay. so, and so, you know, one of the things that we will uh, be doing uh, fairly soon is looking at how the CARES funding has been utilized and adult day certainly is a big part of that. So we'll, we wanna hear back from you 
about that. Uh, and I don't know the date yet. We're still we're still in the planning process for when that'll happen. But Angela, it's a heads up for you. Be okay, great. thank you. Okay. Um, and so, and then the, I guess the question is, as the bill um, flowed through Human Services, were the adult days considered as part of the planning process? Are, are they in the bill itself? In, in H611, yes. the, um, the Adult Day Association was part of the Older Vermonters Act Working Group, participated in that process, and I do believe um, testified um, during the process in human services as well. Okay, so we'll have to keep our eyes open because I think we all agree that the adult days are significant. Uh, they're, they're really important uh, for this population, the older population. Okay, good question. Thank you, Senator Cummings, Senator Ingram, Senator McCormick. This is all good. Um, so Ruby Baker is here and she is the, um, are, you're the executive director of, uh, the, of Cove. So Ruby, have, are you here? There she is, I think. She might have had to step out for a minute. I saw she had some company with her. All right, so why don't we... Um, why don't we hold off on Ruby's testimony and we'll move to Janet Hunt. Um, and you're the executive director of uh, Triple A's, Merit of the Aging uh, Association on Aging. Yes. Ah, area, Vermont Association of the Area Agencies on Aging. I always say Triple A. So and then when you have to say the full thing, who knows what it is? So Janet, I know, you. right? Us, like. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and Senators. Um, so thank you for the introduction. My name is just for the record, my name is Janet Hunt, and I'm the executive director for the Vermont Association of Area Agencies on Aging, which, ha which has five member agencies uh, on aging located throughout the state. I've revised my written testimony uh, that I've already submitted uh, this morning. Uh, and I'll follow up with um, the revisions to Nellie after today's testimony. Good, but thank I you. I thought of a few other things that I wanted to add to it. I'm going to interrupt you just for a second and I, because I see that Ruby is back. And, and Ruby, I, 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 I saw that you had a, a little guy with you. And I'm, my question is, um, are, is your time okay to listen to Janet first? Or should we jump you in at this point? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Janet can go ahead and I will, uh, I'm happy right. to join in afterwards. Thank you. Okay, good. And thank you for being um, patient with us. That's so good. Janet, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, sure. Sure, thank you. So H611, the Older Vermonters Act, is truly a what I call a call to action for all individuals as we're aging and fits exactly how V4A well, V4A is the acronym for the Vermont Association of Area Agencies on Aging. It fits exactly how V4A envisions a Vermont that values and supports us as we age. Um, and before I go any further, I'd like us to think about aging as not something that's different from who we are. It's not a separate population of who we are. It is all, it, it is all of us, it contains all of us. It involves all of us to be thinking about aging. It isn't a separate population. So the area agencies on aging already provide the supports and services that is outlined in H611 through the Older Vermonters Act. So therefore we fully support the passing of the bill, especially as it requires more collaboration and more uh, accountability and overall purposeful inclusion of aging within our Vermont communities. I was a participant of the Old Vermonters Working Group as a representative of the, of the area agencies on aging uh, to build the foundation for the act as we see it today, as we're looking at it today. And I know firsthand how strongly invested all members of the working group uh, are and were to see us improve the health and well-being of older adults in our, in our state. I know you've, that Jennifer's already reviewed some of the certain, and, and Angela too, the, 
the elements, but I just, again, want to highlight it. It's, it's definitely a, a wonderful piece of uh, work and want to highlight and accentuate some of the uh, key areas that the bill addresses. Uh, it addresses the key principles that the state of Vermont must adhere to for the supports and the protections and a system of services that are critical for older Vermonters to give up to have optimal health and wellness, housing and transportation and community design, family caregiver support and financial security that you asked about before Senator Lyons. It defines how we care for older adults who have the greatest economic need, greatest social need and uh, those who are at risk of self neglect. It makes it clear how who within the state is responsible to administer all aspects of the Older Vermonters Act and hold specific agencies accountable for the implementation, coordination and follow through of services and supports. The bill will require both qualitative and quantitative data to monitor and evaluate the system's success as it focuses services to individuals within the greater greatest economic and social need. The bill requires that the Secretary of Administration in collaboration with Dale must develop a Vermont action plan for aging well and which shall uh, provide strategies and cultivate partnerships for implementation across sectors to promote aging <clears throat> with health choice and dignity in order to establish and maintain the age-friendly state for all Vermonters. The action plan also addresses the additional needs and concerns of older Vermonters and their families in the event of a public health crisis, a natural disaster, or other widespread emergency in this state. It requires home and community-based rate studies to determine Medicaid reimbursement rates for providers of home and community-based services that are sufficient to recruit and retain individual service providers and allow individuals to attain and maintain their highest level of functioning in accordance with a care plan, while also creating a fair and equitable balance between cost containment and high quality care. It requires the creation of a self-neglect working group to provide recommendations for, re for adults who due to physical or mental impairment or diminished capacity are unable to perform essential self-care tasks. It provides purposeful inclusivity to a population that might otherwise be marginalized. The Vermont Association of Area Agencies has worked to build support from our partners across the state who have signed on to um, support H611 and these partner agencies include, to name a few, the Vermont Association of Adult Day Services, the Vermont Association of Senior Centers and Meal Providers, Green Mountain Transit, SASH, the Support and Services at Home, Bayada Home Healthcare, Cathedral Square, Barry Housing Authority, United Way of Addison County, Orleans County Restorative Justice Center, and of course the five member agencies of, of the Association of um, Area Agencies on Aging. H611 and all of the elements that it contains should pass because we all care about our parents and our grandparents and because we should care to set the stage now for the stake of our children, the sake of our children and our grandchildren's uh, future as they age. My testimony includes the uh, so the supporters, my written testimony includes the supporters that we've gathered um, as attached to my written testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, what you have done with your testimony is to remind me how critical this is, not just for looking at older Vermonters, but looking at aging as a part of all of our lives. Yes, exactly. From the time we're born until yes. the end, we, uh, we're aging, so. Yes, I'm glad you got that. I wanted to frame it in that way so that we would realize this isn't yeah. just about the current population of 65 and older. 
No, I think it's about everyone in the state. And so the difficulty is ensuring that at each developmental stage of our lives, our communities are receptive to our needs. Um, and in particular, right now, we're thinking about a population that is over 65 and has some needs that we probably haven't provided uh, as adequately as we should have in the past. So yes. questions for, uh, for Ruby, and uh, not Janet. Ruby, Janet. <laughs> Any questions for Janet? So Janet, you said that you were gonna update your testimony. I am, and I'll send it to Nellie. So, and as you're, as you're listening to the discussion that we've had and the questions that we've asked, I, I noticed that you did mention a couple of the areas of our, of our interest and it would be helpful if, if possible to elaborate on any one of those, including the financial security piece or others that you might have ideas about that might improve the bill, whether it's food insecurity or um, personal hygiene or whatever. Uh, so sure absolutely okay good any other questions for janet okay um so b4a is the new acronym that i have to remember <laughs> okay i can't use triple a anymore well we have an association it's actually been in existence for many years all right 2012, okay. 2007. Nice. I'm so far behind the times. No, no. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, Ruby Baker is here from Cove. And Ruby, thank you for being patient. And why don't you uh, give us your testimony? I think we have it online as well. Yes, you have my testimony online. And thank you for being patient with my small people. <laughs> oh, small um, people are delightful. Yeah, yes, most of the time. Yeah. Um, for the record, my name is Ruby Baker. I am the executive director of Community of Vermont Elders. COVE is a grassroots and membership-based organization, and we have been advocating for the rights of older Vermonters since 1984. Um, I wanna start off just thanking this committee for making this bill a priority. This has been a very unusual session, as you know, and. Um, and we're really grateful that you're taking this bill up. Um, we know that you have a lot of priorities on your plate and a lot to work on, so, so thank you. Um, firstly, COVE very much supports age 611, of course, and we have been part of this process through the passage of the Older Vermonters Act Working Group. We participated in the working group and, um, and have been very vocal in our support of this bill as it passed through the House. We believe it will improve the quality of life for older Vermonters, uh, specifically by increasing the safety and security of older Vermonters and the self-determination. And I know we've sort of highlighted those things um, both in, in Jen's walkthrough and Angela's testimony, but those are really key to, um, to how we wanna think about this bill and holding those two things in balance. Um, as, again, as you've heard, there was a huge amount of collaboration that happened throughout the course of this bill. And um, you have to go in the other room, sweetie. Thank you. Um, and um, so I wanna highlight a, a few areas of the bill where we support some minor changes or uh, where we see some very specific strengths. And Charlie's gonna join me. Um, Terrific. <laughs> All right, hi, Charlie. Um, <laughs> uh, so first in the house, we supported the original language in the bill, which included a path to secure appropriations that would begin to build financial parity and stability for our home and community-based services. And I know you had, questioned um, why nursing homes were not called out. And this bill actually really, that, that original language was an attempt to pull home and community-based services onto the same level 
as nursing homes in how we think about them. Every year we fight for an increase to our home and community-based service med, um, Medicare rates, and we are asking um, that we not have to fight quite so hard, that that move through a regular process. And so, you know, those home and community-based services are underfunded. They're always underfunded. We're seeing that now as we see closures in our communities, as we see um, services being dialed back when, uh, when specific strains come on the system. Um, this language was replaced with a study. We don't think we need another study. We know that they're underfunded and we would support the reinsertion of the original rate setting language. Um, in light of COVID, we have seen just how fragile the long-term care system is. And um, as we respond to COVID and begin to repair our home and community-based service system, we really have to focus on fortifying our programs so that they can be responsive and flexible when crises come up. And um, you know, they, they need the financial capacity to, uh, to be competitive in the marketplace to be up to date in their training and safety and no, to be kept no. um, for their facilities to be maintained at a level that can provide safety for, for and the best care for everyone. And if we don't take the time to recognize the true cost of doing business, we can never have a truly robust and coordinated system of services and supports that has the capacity to address the needs of our growing older population. We know one in four Vermonters will be over the age of 65 within this decade. That's huge. We have to talk about it. We have to address it and we have to pay for it. Um, so I, uh, you know, we need to invest in our service providers and, and guarantee them stability of funding. And I would say that the need for funding goes beyond home and community-based services as defined here. And I'm specifically in this situation calling out the senior centers. They are critical and there really is no state funding mechanism that supports senior centers. And I think that this committee could spend some time thinking about how to, um, how we might do that because they are part of, um, they are part of our health and wellness system and deserve that consideration. Can I ask you this question while we're on sure. senior centers? Have we an identified um, set of senior centers uh, through the state? So uh, obviously there are places where seniors congregate, which are not uh, what I would call senior centers. And then we have senior centers like the Winooski Senior Center or the Heineberg Senior Center in my district, uh, to name a couple, um, do we have a system of senior centers similar to a system of parent-child centers that uh, we've fully, that we've identified and that we provide funding for? Yeah, VASCAMP, Vermont Association of Senior Centers and Mill Providers. So there you go. You can have another acronym for your alphabet soup today. Um, <laughs> Uh, VASCAMP would be the place to go for more information on that. And Jana Clare at the Montpelier Senior Activity Center and Deanna Jones at the Thompson Senior Center are co-directors of that. It's, so it's when volunteers. You, but. When you submit your written testimony, will you include this information for us? Um, I've, yes. Okay, that would be great. Yep. Um, Okay, that's my, so funding is, is the first and foremost. Second, I would say that the bill highlights the protections that older Vermonters need and deserve. Uh, Cove supports a stronger stance on the need for coordinated systems of protections for older people. We, um, Adult Protective Services is called out in this bill, but there is actually um, not much recognition here about how APS and law enforcement and state's attorneys and all of those other pieces of the safety system could work together. You, Senator, would not um, be covered and, and protected by adult protective services, but somebody needs to be protecting all older Vermonters and there needs to be a real recognition for how that's happening. 
and a coordinated system of, of referrals and, and, and services. So we would support a stronger stance on protections for older adults. Um, additionally, the statute that, um, that establishes adult protective services is one of the oldest statutes in the country right now and is working um, throughout COVID with very outdated guidelines based on a time when most, uh, most vulnerable adults were living in institutional settings. And that's just not the case anymore. Vermont has really committed to our aging in place model and the Vermont statute for adult protective services hasn't really caught up with that. So, um, so yeah, I would recommend that that we looked at a little more closely. Um, the th third and fourth things that I wanna highlight are areas that we are just very supportive of. I, I don't see any additional um, changes that I wanna call out, but the self-determination and safety and protection, sometimes those two feel like they're at odds. And I just wanna recognize that in order to create the Vermont we want to create, where um, where older adults and younger adults can grow old with dignity, um, those two really need to be held in balance. And I appreciate that those are called out first and foremost at the front of the bill that that this is what we deserve. And then uh, fourth is the master plan on aging. I was also at the presentation by the SCAN Foundation. Um, and um, I, I, I wanna highlight that during COVID and, and for many years before, older Vermonters have been the victims of ageism, whether it's benevolent ageism, negligent or hostile. And the things that we do now whether what the things that I do, the things that you do, all of these things, uh, traveling, working, singing, hiking, raising children, um, they could very well be the exact same things we're doing when we're 70, 80, or 100, um, including yeah. raising children. There are, <laughs> there are thousands of kinship caregivers. There are grandparents who are supportive. There, there are just, those are all the things that we continue to do throughout our life. And so the systems that support us when we're 30 and 40 are the same systems that are supporting us when we're 60 and 70 and 80. Um, you know, you know all the agencies, but if we're, whether we're talking about transportation or fish and wildlife or health or public safety, these are all the same systems that are supporting us. So we need really to pull out and higher level when we're thinking about aging. Dale is is vital to the aging process, but they're not the only ones and they know it. We know, we all know it. And they shouldn't be left with this task alone. So um, pulling that master plan up into the Secretary of Ad Administration really ensures that, um, that the plan be statewide, that we're talking about everything that affects all older adults. And I really see this section as the next evolution of aging policy. Um, so I'm, we are very, very strongly supportive of creating this master plan. Um, questions for me, that's all I have. Um, thank you. And it would be great to have your uh, testimony in writing, in particular, you've made some suggestions about changes that I think we need to discuss before we accept or reject. And then uh, your other comments uh, at the end are really important. So uh, if you, you have my testimony that, in writing. Nellie. Good, you that's have it. great. All right. Um, okay, I didn't see it online and I got Nellie will get it up for us. All right, questions uh, for Ruby. It's there now if you refresh. Oh, great. Thanks, Senator Ingram. No more. All right. No oh more. God. No more, Ruby. <laughs> 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 Any questions for Ruby Baker of Cove? Yeah, that, was, that was good. Uh, I, I greatly appreciate your comments about how ageist we are. Um, it hits all of us at different times when we start talking about bringing young people into the state because we're too old. 
yeah. that really affects a number of us. When we talk about getting younger people into politics, we're too old. That really hurts. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're all vital uh, until we're dead. So I, <laughs> I, I, I really, uh, I'm glad you said what you said. And I'm going to become more vocal about that when I start hearing my political counterparts uh, talk about we need younger people in the state house. So not that we don't need them, but it, the people we have are not bad. <laughs> uh, Senator McCormick, your hand is up. Thank you. Yeah, there's also the problem that any time a computer doesn't work right, if you're an old person using it, the assumption is you messed up. <laughs> Even though, you know, I know how to, I know how to click send, for example. It's I didn't mess up. The computer messed up, and people don't believe it. That's ages. In my testimony, yeah. you will if you if you read it word for word, uh, which you may or may not, uh, you will we see will. that um, aging is um, discrimination against our own future selves. So we would be Sorry. wise as young people and old people and infants to remember that. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, that'll be good. We need that. We need that fuel for our fire. Uh, but, the, you know, and, and it's an interesting conversation, I think, that we all need to have uh, when we're in our 20s and 30s. And, and then when you get in your 40s, you start to realize that, golly, Ned, you know, 50 isn't so old. And when you get to the end of your 40s, you realize, gee, you know, 60 isn't that old and I'm still climbing the high peaks. So um, people need to have this conversation so that they can appreciate life as a continuum and not uh, these little chunks of time that show up at different different places. So yeah, um, I, was, I, was on a, I was just on a call this morning uh, with a man who is celebrating his uh, he and his wife are celebrating their 59th uh, wedding anniversary um, today. And, he, you know, he's 81 and he's one of the wisest and most vital people I know. So, yeah, it's. Oh, yeah, it yeah. is. Just because someone walks slowly doesn't mean they think badly. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, any, so now, now that we've uh, fully let out vented uh, <laughs> questions for any of our witnesses on H611. Mm. So committee, my question of you is now that you've heard a little bit about the bill and the time that the House Human Services folks and others have spent putting it together, um, <clears throat> is this a bill we want to, we want, would like to complete work on before this session is over. Can, can I just ask, um, yes. is, is Dale going to um, have um, their testimony posted? Yes. It's not listed. Everybody else has got something up, but. Um, we, 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 have, we have coerced Angela into that and she will be putting it up for us. Thank you. Yeah, very important. Okay, so committee, uh, we'll, <clears throat> we are going to schedule additional time on this bill. I'm not sure that it will be tomorrow <clears throat> unless, uh, unless we can get some of the folks who I know are interested to be with us. But we are going to uh, follow through with the bill. It's, re it's really very important. Uh, I think we all understand that. Uh, and, it, and it will be important for us to read the bill thoroughly <clears throat> so please do that if you haven't already. And then uh, there are some suggestions that have been made about moving a little more uh, aggressively in some of the sections uh, and whether uh, this is the time to do that or not. And we'll talk about that. I think uh, uh, Ruby Baker brought up the rate setting language that was in the bill and was taken out and whether or not we want to proceed with that. And there'll be other areas as well. So. Uh, but I do think we just we just need to have some time to read the bill. And then I do know that the Attorney General's office is very interested in testifying. So we'll be connecting with them and getting them in 
and um, as well as others. So any other, um, any other comments, discussion on H611? Ooh, okay. So uh, what I'm gonna say is a thank you all for being here to provide your input on the bill. Um, seriously, uh, yep, uh, you, you have added a great deal. Uh, appreciate it, our two house members. And we may be circling back to you with questions about how decisions were made and where the issues lie, uh, as well as with Angela, Janet and Ruby, so. Don't, don't leave us when we're looking at this bill. We, if, if you, and I will say this, if you would like to be invited into our meeting as we hear additional testimony, just let Nellie know and we're happy to have you uh, with us so you can make comment when we start getting into the markup part of the bill. Okay. All right. So a committee, what I'm gonna suggest is, um, sort of blasphemous that uh, we take a 10 minute break. Yay. <laughs> and uh, in the, in, yeah, so let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at, at 10.55, Nellie. <clears throat> or Nellie, are you there? I am, yes. Okay, good. Why don't you, uh, why don't you put the, uh, the, the shield up for 10 minutes and we'll we'll be back uh, to move on to H607. Okay, great, we'll do. All right, thank you. Take care everyone. See you in a bit. Ah, thank you. I think what what we'll do is We'll begin with our two House members who can introduce the bill to us, H607. This is the act relating to increasing the supply of nurses and primary care providers in Vermont. It's a really important bill. Uh, let, and I know uh, that the House Human Services Committee worked very hard on this bill and worked also with their Appropriations Committee. So we'll hear from them. Then we'll hear from... Uh, Ina Backus, uh, we'll, we'll go through the bill with Jen Carby first, and then we'll hear from Ina and Nolan, uh, and then we'll decide our next steps. So we have about an hour to do this. We may not use all that time, but we might, you never know. We never know how much time we're gonna use. So, um, I will ask uh, Representative Christensen and Representative Reed how you are want to proceed, who's going first, and thank you for being here uh, to introduce us to the bill. I'm going to go first, and I'll give you some, I'll give the bill some context and why it's important, and then okay. just give you summaries of the sections, and Jen can walk you through, and Peter will talk about this, another, other two sections of the bill, and I'll turn it over to him then, Okay. Terrific. Okay. Um, as I said, this is, um, let me give some brief context and outline the problem we're trying to solve. The Rural Health Task Force commissioned last year, it reported that Vermont is currently short 5,000 nurses. And that was before the COVID pandemic. Um, this number includes hospitals, uh, nurses in hospitals, long-term facilities, and home health agencies. Um, AHAC, hold on, my computer's doing something funny. Um, okay, sorry. Um, let me see. AHAC, the Area Health Education Center in 2018, um, snapshot identified a shortage of 70 primary care physicians in Vermont, which includes family medicine, internal medicine, obstetrics and pediatrics. And the reason for these shortfalls, as we all know and heard so many times before, is we have an aging population and workforce. 36% of Vermont's primary care physicians are over age 60. 
close to 20% of primary care APRNs and licensed practical nurses are over age 60. Provider burnout, especially with COVID, rising higher education costs, close to 50% increase for medical students and nurses in the last 10 years, as well as a tight national healthcare workforce, all contributed to the shortage we have to dig out of. We already spend 20% of our state and personal budgets on healthcare. Providers must deliver quality care. They cannot reduce staffing levels, cut hours, or provide self-checkout kiosks. Currently, providers must rely heavily on contracted traveling nurses. And these traveling nurses, technicians, and primary care staff, which cost double the amount of staff dollars for these positions. In FY19, 11 of 15 hospitals spent $56 million on traveling staff. Um, and home health agencies spent 10.5 million on travelers. Every new addition to our healthcare workforce directly saves us money on traveling staff. This is also a workforce bill that will develop and keep professional people in Vermont to train at our colleges and raise their families and send their children to our school. So basically this is a strike all bill and it has four principles components. Section one creates a small task force led by the director of healthcare reform to evaluate and update Vermont's strategic plan for our healthcare workforce. We have not had this in a number of years. Um, the position is on the statutes, but we haven't we haven't done anything with it. And so we don't really have a census of what the shortage is. We have to um, get the healthcare workforce, rural task workforce together. And we had, you know, we're just catching snips of, of numbers of how short we actually are. So anyway, section one creates a small task force um, and it's a small one. So it's nimble and, and, and flexible. It's led by the director of healthcare reform to evaluate and update Vermont's strategic plan for the workforce. The seven member team will include representatives from healthcare providers, state agencies, and importantly, our educators in the colleges. The plan will review the current capacity of our healthcare workforce and delivery system in Vermont. It would also include how state government, universities and colleges and the state's education and training programs may develop the resources to educate, recruit, and retain healthcare professionals to achieve reform <laughs> principles and purposes. Section two requires a report from the task force to be delivered to the Green Mountain Care Board by December 2021 and to the relevant legislative committees by January 5th, 15th, 2022. So the meat of the bill here is I'm going to talk about the nurses and Peter will talk about the physicians. Section three um, expands this. Oh, no, section three, Peter will talk about. Section four proposes a program specifically targeted at nursing. The section leverages existing nursing scholarship program administered by uh, BSAC and expands funding and also relaxes some restrictions on eligibility and timing of the application. We seek to encourage entry level nurses, those nurses by prioritizing those pursuing, pursuing practical nursing certificates. And these are, as we know, our, our um, long-term care facilities have such a shortage of these. So we're prioritizing the practical nursing certificate and second, those pursuing associate degrees, which lead to RNs. You can take the national RN exam after an associate degree. And then finally, those seeking a bachelor's degree. The testimony received suggests that as nurses move up, the, they move up the career ladder, ladder and often have a, um, a lot of opportunities for training, often with employer incentives and support. So if you get them in the pipeline, they will they will move up probably. And we have made financial need a primary factor in awards as well as prior academic success. Um, and 
this was not in the current VSAC program. It was a very different scale of entering in. We're talking about financial need now. Somebody wants to move up to a licensed practical nurse. Often they don't even have that little bit of money to get started. Um, so we have financial need a priority factor in the awards. The application process will have no specified deadlines. It shall be awarded on a rolling basis. Um, as nursing students often go part-time and do not follow a strict academic cal calendar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Priority will also be given to nursing students attending Vermont nursing programs. And as with the physician program, the payback is the nursing scholarship reci recipients will be required to work um, in Vermont for one year for every year of scholarship they get. Um, I'll turn it over to Peter to talk about physicians and where the money's coming from. Take it away, Peter. So um, uh, jumping back to uh, section three, which addresses the uh, physician scholarships, this was, was really one of the original core pieces uh, when this uh, legislation was first proposed and we, we modified it a bit. Uh, but the, the main objective is to try to start building a better pipeline of physicians in Vermont uh, to address the, the shortages, as uh, mentioned by uh, Representative Christensen. Um, so we have, uh, we have basically expanded um, the statute to include a new scholarship program aimed at building much needed rural primary care physician resources in Vermont. So we modeled this initiative after a national program, the National Health Service Corps program which has been very successful and uh, to uh, help address the shortage of physicians across rural and underserved regions of the United States. Uh, it's a very competitive program, so uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to get uh, access to, but it's, uh, it's a great model for how this could work. Um, the proposed Vermont program would be administered by the Department of Health and AHEC and provide five grants to third year students and five grants to fourth year students at the UVM College of Medicine for the full in-state tuition, which is currently $37,000. The grant recipients must commit to practicing primary care following their residency in a rural health professional shortage uh, or medically underserved area of our state for two years for each year of scholarship granted. Primary care includes the specialties defined by the National Health Service Corps program, and scholarships would be reduced by any other state or federal educational grant assistance received by the student for the same academic year. A recipient who does not fulfill the practice requirement will be required to repay the grant plus interest based on guidelines determined by the National Health Service Corps program. So it's not a freebie if you decide to not stay in Vermont. Um, so the, the funding for these two programs, um, the, the original idea um, came from the governor's proposed budget way back in January, where he called for a million dollars of tax credits specifically aimed at nursing. And so we took that million dollars as sort of our guide and uh, refashioned it a bit and uh, basically took the, the first cut of it was $370,000 to fund the 10 medical scholarships. And then the remaining 637 or $630,000 we allocated to the nursing scholarships, which is a significant boost uh, compared to what the nursing scholarship program uh, was that exists at this moment. Um, so in, in working with the appropriations committee, uh, to then find the million dollars to, to start this process. Uh, the, the conclusion was that uh, we could take a million dollars of a, an original $5 million allocation to the Department of Health from the Tobacco Settlement Fund back in 2018 for 2019 fiscal year, which due to an oversight was really never spent. So, uh, by taking a million dollars from that fund to fund this program, we can also use federal funds to match that million dollars, which uh, using the existing, existing formulas, the, the doctor scholarship program would receive a $441,000 match for a total of 811,000. And the nursing program 
uh, would receive a $751,000 match for a total funding of 1.38 million. So we can we can basically double, uh, more than double our, our, our funding that comes from the state to allow us to safely fund these programs for at least the first couple of years. And our anticipation is that, that we would include these in, in future general fund requests. Uh, obviously we're in a, in a difficult situation budget wise over the next couple of years. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think uh, having a couple of years uh, funded would be a, an excellent start to this program. So that is the sum of it and uh, not sure where we pass it back to next. I would, I would like to just say that the committee voted 10-01 on the bill and the House unanimously with no vote, no, no votes passed the bill. And now we turn to you. <laughs> uh, you're muted. I said, no pressure. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's, it, it's a lot of work. I understand um, the work that you've done on this and we'll have to sort out where the financial piece is right now, where the appropriations is right now. Uh, I, I, I've asked Nolan to help out a little bit with that, but um, certainly the need is there. We understand that and workforce is a, is a very important uh, part of the work that we have to do. So thank you very much for that. Questions for Anne-Marie or Peter. Senator Ingram. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that. That was very thorough walkthrough. I appreciate that. Um, uh, just a, a question about the nurses. Um, the, well, the, doc, the primary care physicians have to work in rural areas, right? But the nurses can work anywhere uh, after they receive their scholarships is that is that right? in vermont and mm -hmm. i believe i think we also kept in part of the original scholarship within 10 miles of vermont no we took that out we took that out you just got to work right. in vermont and sign, sign so Jen, go ahead. So, well, I'm actually, we should go through the language. I'm not. Well, we'll yes, why don't we hold that question and the, when we go through the, through mm -hmm. the bill itself, the language of the bill itself. Um, so why don't we do that right now and then we'll come back and ask further questions if we need to. We'll go through the bill and then we'll hear from uh, Ina and Nolan and in whichever order they think is the best. Sorry. Didn't mean to start okay. that yet. Nope. Go right ahead. No. All right. Go I was right trying to get it ready. Again. It's all trying to get it ready, and I jumped again. All right. Go ahead. All right. So this is um, H six oh seven, an act relating to increasing the supply of nurses and primary care providers in Vermont. You did get an overview, a pretty detailed overview, from two members of the House Health Care Committee. Um, so we'll just look at the language for a bit. Um, the first section deals with that healthcare workforce strategic plan that Representative Christensen talked about. This requires the director of healthcare reform in the Agency of Human Services to maintain a current healthcare workforce development strategic plan rather than an existing law. It's oversee the development. Um, and it takes out some language allowing that the director to designate someone else uh, to convene meetings and prepare the draft plan and move some language, some Green Mountain Care Board language um, to session law. So there's a, a number of changes that would be um, implemented if this language were to pass. Um, but mainly the, the takeaway is that in maintaining the strategic plan, it would direct the director of healthcare reform or designee to consult with an advisory group composed of seven members, at least one of whom must be a nurse to develop and maintain the strategic plan. It would have one representative of the Green Mountain Care Board's primary care advisory group, a representative of the state colleges, someone from AHEX Workforce Initiative, a representative of FQHCs, a representative of Vermont hospitals, a representative of physicians, and a representative of long-term care facilities. Uh, the director designee would be the chair, and then it changes some of what needs to go into the strategic plan. 
Um, so it still requires the director to ensure that the strategic plan includes recommendations on how to develop Vermont's healthcare workforce, including the current capacity and capacity issues, um, but it eliminates requirements around resources that would be necessary to achieve certain goals, uh, leaves in how state government, universities and colleges, the state's educational system, entities providing education and training programs related to healthcare workforce and others can develop the resources in the workforce and delivery system uh, to educate, recruit and retain healthcare professionals to achieve Vermont's healthcare reform principles and purposes. This is the same as existing law, um, takes out a requirement to review the extent to which um, individual healthcare professionals begin and stop practicing in Vermont and uh, looking at factors that hinder or assist in recruitment or retention. And so it just leaves a third criteria, assessing the availability of state and federal funds for healthcare workforce development. So under current law, beginning January 15th, 2013, the director or designee is supposed to provide the strategic plan um, and provide periodic updates on modifications as necessary. Uh, I think there was an original, an initial plan, but I'm not sure if there have been any updates since 2013. Ina may know more on that. And then section two has the healthcare workforce strategic plan and report. So this directs the director of healthcare reform in connection with that advisory group to update the healthcare workforce strategic plan and submit a draft of it to the Green Mountain Care Board for review and approval by December 1st of this year, it requires the board to review and approve the plan within 30 days following receipt, and then would have the updated plan submitted to um, this committee, the House Healthcare Committee and the Economic Development Committees in the House and Senate by January 15th of 2021. So those are the two sections on the healthcare workforce strategic plan. Then we look at the sections that you heard about from uh, Representative Reed, the first being on medical students and primary care. This directs um, the Department of Health in collaboration with AHEC, really with the Office of Primary Care and Area Health Education Centers programs at UVM College of Medicine to establish a rural primary care physician scholarship program that would cover the medical school tuition for up to five third and up to five fourth year medical students annually who commit to practicing primary care in a rural health professional shortage or medically underserved area of the state. And for each year that they get the scholarship, um, the, the recipient incurs an obligation of two years of full-time service or four years of half-time service. Students who get it in the third year are eligible to get another scholarship for the fourth year. And as Representative Reed said, the amount is set at the in-state tuition rate, and that would be less any other state or federal education grant assistance that they get for the student gets for that year. The approved specialties are those recognized by the National Health Service Corps at the time of the scholarship award, which may include, these are the current categories, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology and psychiatry. And if a scholarship recipient does not fulfill the commitment to practice primary care in accordance with the terms of the award is liable to repay the full amount of the scholarship plus interest as calculated under the National Health Service Corps program. Um, and this is the appropriation of $811,226 in global commitment investment funds. So this is the, um, this is the gross amount appropriated to the Department of Health in uh, FY21 for scholarship for these scholarships. Um, and I think Nolan's gonna talk to you more about the money, but this also expresses a legislative intent that scholarship funds to expand Vermont's primary care physician workforce should continue to be appropriated in future years to ensure that Vermonters have access to necessary healthcare services, preferably in their own community. So it can only appropriate for one year, but it's expressing intent to continue this as an ongoing scholarship program. Section five uh, appropriates funds from, uh, appropriates $1,381,276 in global commitment funds to the health department for additional nursing student scholarships. Um, 
that are administered by VSAC. And as you heard about from Representative Christensen, the first priority goes to students who are pursuing a practical nursing certificate and who will be eligible to sit for the NCLEX PN examination up, uh, upon completion of the certificate. So first priority is practical nursing certificate. Second priority is for students pursuing an associate's who will be able to sit for the NCLEX RN exam upon graduation. And third priority is for students pursuing a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing. Eligibility requirements, the applicant must demonstrate financial need, demonstrate academic capacity by carrying at least a 2.5 grade point average in their course of study prior to receiving the fund award, and agree to work as a nurse in Vermont for a minimum of one year following licensure for each year of scholarship awarded. It also uh, gives first preference to students attending an accredited post-secondary educational institution in Vermont. There's no deadline to apply, as you heard from Representative Christensen, these will be awarded on a rolling basis as long as funds are available and the funds from any funds remaining at the end of FY21 would roll over and be available for the same purpose in FY22. Uh, and it expresses legislative intent that scholarship funds would continue to be appropriated in, for this purpose in future years. Section 5A is where the money comes from. So this is taking from an FY19. In FY19, there was $5 million appropriated from the tobacco litigation. Actually, it was appropriated in uh, FY 2018, um, some of uh, $5 million was appropriated from the Tobacco Litigation Settlement Fund to AHS for um, workforce for high quality substance use disorder treatment and mental health professional workforce development. Um, and so that was broken out to be $1.5 million for FY 19, $1.5 million for FY 20, and 1.5 million for FY21, and then 500,000 for FY22. So this would take of the FY21 appropriation uh, of that 1.5 million, it would take 1 million to be allocated as the state match to fund the scholarships for the nursing students and medical students. And then the remaining 500,000 would be subject to um, agency appropriation for our, um, proposed expenditures to the agency for the mental health and substance use disorder workforce. And then sections six and seven are really just some technical cleanup stuff, reorganizing a little bit in um, the, reorganizing and redesignating to make the um, statutes line up in a way that makes sense in the chapter that deals with these nursing program or nursing and um, medical student scholarship programs. And then we have an effective date would take effect on July 1st. So this is another one that would need to be revisited. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. I, I know there'll be questions. Um, do you, are there any questions right now for Jen uh, before we move on to Ina and Nolan? I think a lot of my questions lie with the the funding process and where it is with our appropriations committee, if anywhere. Any questions? Okay. Uh, Nolan, Nolan, do you think that we should move to you or to Ina at yeah. this point? I think yes. I can do it real quick. I mean, really, it's just gonna... Okay. Um, reiterating what Representative Reed said. Uh, Nellie, can you pull up the fiscal note? Or do I have access? Uh, uh, no, uh, I, we don't give have you access. What's that? I will uh, give you access. Uh, there it is. Your co-host now, and it's posted to the, um, to the Senate Health and Welfare webpage as well. Right. Okay. So I think the page of the fiscal note kind of highlights the high points. And I, like I said, I Representative Reed covered it, but this sort of lays it out for you visually. Um, <clears throat> that there is a total of $1 million of general fund, which draws 1.1 to federal funds for a total 
uh, gross of 2.2 million. Um, 370 was for the primary care physician scholarships. 630 was for the nurse education scholarships. As Representative Reed um, indicated, in the governor's budget, he they had allocated a million dollars for a nurse program. Um, legislature wasn't quite keen on how it was being implemented. They heard from the different schools and just felt there was a better way to allocate that amount of money. However, that money was had already been scooped in the bigger picture of the appropriation side on the house. But at the same time, we were able to, we were able to find a, a, a bucket of money, which was laid out as Jen laid out, where they took one point, they looked the, the third year of that 2018 bill where there was 1.5 million for mental health and substance use uh, workforce stuff, and they took a million out of the $21 that was in that 2018 bill to, and reallocated in here. So that's how they found that money, and that's what I highlighted in Section 5A and the second page of this note. So again, uh, I think Representative Reed iterated it. I'm just reiterating it so you can see it visually. That's all I have to say. So, so let me ask a question of clarification about the 2018 lack of expenditure. Was that a Department of Health expenditure? Um, it's, um, it was, I think it might have been. Uh, I have to look at, let me get out of this here. How do I stop the screen share? Oh, there we go, stop the screen share. Uh, I was just had Jen's bill pulled up and it was, uh, it was, it was tobacco, uh, it was tobacco litigation money is 5 million. And it was just appropriated to Agency of Human Services. It didn't, it didn't specify which uh, department it was going to in the in the bill, the underlying bill. Right. So just to to clarify a little bit too, if you look a little bit further at the language, the sums that are appropriated were not allowed to be distributed until the agency provided proposed expenditures as part of their applicable year budget adjustment request or budget or budget adjustment request, depending on the year. Um, so some of them I think hadn't, hadn't necessarily been decided and I'm not sure that there were proposals made in, in the budget and budget adjustment acts. Nolan, does that sound about right? That sounds about right. Can you hold on a second? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry, I had a phone call in on uh, on the answering machine. It would have gotten in the way. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, questions for Nolan about the uh, about the fiscal note, at least the you know the the total appropriation that we're seeing here. Um, the question I have is: Is it currently in the budget? Do we know that? So it was initially, um, the way it was uh, framed in the house was that they would incorporate it as part into their budget framework. Okay, so at this point, what I'm hearing you say then is that at this point, the house is formulating its proposal and that as far as we know, this will be in the house budget. Yeah, I mean, this this bill was passed out of the House with the underlying premise that it would be covered in the budget, in the House okay. budget. So this, okay. of course, and so I know that the House Health Care Committee plans to uh, communicate with the with the Appropriations Committee to remind them if they have don't already know that it would be part of their context. Okay, so. Um before we move on to Ina and, and listen to her testimony, um, I mean, this it doesn't preclude our continuing work on the bill itself, but we also need to know that, uh, especially Senator McCormick and Senator Westman, that this is a heads up for the Appropriations Committee as well. So there's going to have to be some coordination going on. And I, I think it makes sense to have you two be leading that. Go ahead, Senator Westman. My question was, what was the timing of its passage in, in the House? Was it early? Like it went, 
when when was the timing of it? It was on June 16th. Oh, so it was after. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay. All right. Yes, that is helpful. Okay. Well, let's just keep all of this uh, rolling around in our brains a little bit. Um, and and why don't we? Any other questions for Nolan or Jen? All right. So Ina, thank you for being here. And um, perhaps you could comment from your perspective of healthcare reform, but also administratively, your, your perspective on what's in the bill. Thank you. For the record, Ina Backus, Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services. My primary comment on the bill regarding um, the activities outlined for which the Director of Healthcare Reform position would be the uh, primary responsible party um, relate to the timing and the timeline for the submission of the report to the Green Mountain Care Board and then subsequently to the legislature. I, uh, due to COVID-19, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned that we can arrive at a meaningful update to the strategic plan in the timeline that's prescribed currently. Although I recognize that through the Rural Health uh, Services Task Force or Commission on which I was a participant, that there were good priorities and strategies identified through the, that group and that those could certainly be uh, core to recommendations and I would expect that they would be. However, the legislation does require the, the work with the advisory group and so I couldn't make that determination unilaterally that those priorities identified would be the priorities. So that's my, that's my, my feedback is um, a little bit of uncertainty regarding the timing due to the many um, potential variables at play in, in this time where we are working at the Agency of Human Services every day to address the global health pandemic. So uh, given that, what timeline is more appropriate from your perspective? I, um, I certainly recognize that we need to and, and support work to address workforce shortages now. And some of that work is indeed playing out with the uh, healthcare stabilization grants that we are providing in terms of um, stabilizing the healthcare workforce, although it's not a direct workforce development initiative, it certainly is important for maintaining workforce during these times. Hazard pay, similarly, um, we are very much involved in administering that program that has a significant impact or could have a significant impact on workforce. Uh, so we are, we are involved with initiatives related to workforce now that are very important in this moment. A realistic timeline may, may be um, looking to extend the deadline uh, by a year, but I don't know that that's necessarily, um, I don't know if that feels like too long, but I think that that would be realistic. Okay, I mean, that's very helpful. We can't, we're not gonna be able to squeeze water out of a stone. And I, and I know how hard everyone is working on uh, the stabilization issues that you're talking about. So we'll, we'll, we'll put this uh, into our discussion uh, on our discussion list and appreciate the work that you're doing um, very much. And we, this, is, this is critically important, but if, if it's not gonna be done right because it, we're trying to rush it, then uh, it makes sense to consider a change in the timeline. 
So thank you for that. Um, so questions for Ina, because I do have another question, but I'll open it up for the committee. Do you have questions for Ina? Okay. Um, the, the report is going to um, the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, so I'm trying to understand the relationship, and maybe this is also for the House members, between the Green Mountain Care Board and some of the planning that we're talking about and the reporting that's going on. Uh, Ina, can you talk to that or is that something Anne-Marie you want to speak to? Well, I believe that the Green Mountain Care Board has identified the workforce as the priority, just the same as the Rural Health Task Force. And um, I'm not, I don't believe the Green Mountain Care Board was in effect in 2013 when this was in statute. And um, I think maybe there was another body and this was a comparable body, but I can't, Jen. I think they were, so I, the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, I believe started in late 2011. Um, so they were in existence, but this is having the report go, updated report go first to the Green Mountain Care Board and then to the legislature. I believe um, it follows with what, had previously been a requirement that the board uh, review and approve the, the workforce strategic plan. Right. Okay. Uh, You're right. So there is an exi a requirement in the existing law that the report or that any updates to the report and the original report go to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, okay. So this is m moving this is sort of revisiting this this idea of a, a strategic plan, um, setting an update for now with a report going to the Green Mountain Care Board and the legislature. Okay. I, I, I understand that. Um, I have, I, the question I have is the role the board is playing and uh, understanding that workforce is key and they have the over, oversight of the health resource allocation plan and what, um, what do individual practitioners play in that planning process. Um, so just some thinking uh, we're all gonna have to do on that one. But, uh, Ina, is there anything else that we should hear uh, about from your uh, perspective. Okay. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, good. Uh, I do have a general, I have, do have one more question and that is, um, and I, I think as we take testimony on the bill uh, later on, we're going to hear the question was dental uh, were dental practitioners considered in the workforce development process? No, because the, there was a shortage of dentists um, several years ago, but the Dental Society did its own push, recruiting push, and uh, the dentistry workforce um, in a survey conducted by the Department of Health uh, that the full-time employees for dentists increased 8.4% since 2005. So it didn't look like they needed help at this point. It was okay. more on the nurses and the primary care physicians. Okay, and that includes pediatric um, yeah. dental care, primary care? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right, uh, we may hear more about that, but it, that, thank you, That's you're on your toes. Thank with you. The, the data, that's super. Work thank on you. it, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, also, you have a, a letter from, um, I believe, an email this morning to the committee from the Co Coalition of Healthcare Providers in support of the bill. Um, right, yeah. Okay. So we will, um, we're going to try and get Jill Olson in as the, we call that the Star Wars Alliance, and we're going to have them come in and testify. So they are supportive, and we did get that letter. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Anybody else a question? Okay, committee, my question of you is on this one, uh, your thoughts on moving forward with the bill itself. I mean, we think we have decided to keep moving on 663 and on 611, and now we have 607 in front of us. And we've heard at least one, uh, one it's not really a barrier, but uh, we need to be in touch with our appropriations process. But your thoughts on H607? And I'd like to move ahead. It's extremely important. Our, we've been saying that about our healthcare workforce for a long time. So it'd be nice right. to make some. It is. And, I, and I, you know, I, yeah, go ahead, Senator McCormick. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm kind of asking uh, Senator Westman what he thinks, because I, I don't, I'm not sure where we are on, on appropriations on this. Rich, do you have any thoughts? You know, the difficulty becomes um, as um, you look forward to next year's budget and where we are um, yeah. when we come back January and what room we might have, it becomes, um, it becomes difficult to say exactly where the Appropriations Committee in the Senate will be. But I will say, um, um, and I'm going to speak personally, I applaud the fact that the House went out and found the money. You know, and they um, they set aside a discrete pot of money and, and did it. So I think that makes it easier to um, take this to the Appropriations Committee um, than, um, than some of the other things that are coming in front of us where we're laying out a path that we might not be able to fulfill in, um, in January. So, um, yeah. but... Um, uh, I, I don't want to speak for the whole of the Appropriations Committee, but I do applaud the fact that this does have money tied directly to it. Yeah. And I'm prepared to advocate for this to the Appropriations Committee. I, oh. You know, I, I would say personally, I think this is um, the most important thing that, um, that we've seen. Yeah. Good. All right. This is all sounding very good. I'm. I, I am agreeing with each, with both with all three of you who have spoken for the bill. Um, Senator Cummings, did you want to add anything or a, a different perspective? Okay. Um, I do think it's critically important. And I and if uh, the fact that the House Appropriations Committee is working with Human Services, and we'll we'll keep our fingers crossed that the funding stays in as we see it then it does give us a little wiggle room while the house is, is going through this. But in the meantime, we will uh, take, um, I think we'll have to take Nolan's fiscal note to the appropriations committee uh, so that as we go through the bill, I mean, there may be some policy changes that are in the bill that we would like to, um, to work on. But uh, other than that, I think it's going to be up to, uh, you guys in a in appropriations to sort this can, one out. Can I um, yeah. just ask the, the question, how, how many um, um, nurses or, or, or nurses students were we potentially thinking this could help? It's hard to say. We had- um, I, I, I understand that because you have different yeah. levels and different- Different but, levels. VSAC had a pot of money. It was an ongoing scholarship for nurses, but their criteria was very rigid and they did not award all the money, even though financial need was a big need. And they didn't, they didn't really, that was on the bottom of their priority list in the, the scale. And so we moved that up because we figured that was it. Plus we opened it up to licensed practical nurses and in different levels to get them in the pipeline. So it's hard to say, and that's also why there's a rolling basis on the scholarships. Anything that's left over and not, not given can be given on a rolling basis. Does um, that help? I, I, I guess a little, but it would be, it would be 
helpful to be able to say, we're going to help, but there's the potential to help this as a minimum up to this amount. Um, you know, when you say dollars like this, it doesn't put it in um, real terms on the people that we need to get out um, doing this work. So I believe I have the number for VSAC, but I can't get my hands on it right now, of how many people applied in the previous scholarship and how many did not get the scholarship because of the criteria was so strict. Uh, they needed essays, they had deadlines, and just people didn't, you know, didn't fit into the categories. Yeah, I, 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 I get, I, I'm just, in, in maybe um, Ina or somebody else can take a look at this and say, within this field, it could be um, a minimum of this or a maximum of that. Um, it's always nice to have the number of individuals that we're, we would be helping. Got it. Well, let's, let's uh, Ina, maybe you know, uh, or, um, or you guys from the house might know who testified from VSAC. I know we're going to have AHEC testifying. AHEC usually has a pretty good understanding of numbers. It's a slightly different set of uh, yeah. constituents. But that's a very good question um, over time because this thing goes on for a little while. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go after that in, in our testimony going forward. We, we've question. heard testimony from, from BSAC from Marilyn Cargill. Okay, yeah, okay, good. We'll, we'll um, go after that. Okay, any other comments? Discussion questions. All right, I you know I I I kind of resist um, sending the fiscal note out without having the information the the information in the bill and the background information supporting it. But I do think that uh, Senator Kitchell fully understands the demands for additional workforce. So we, um, I will probably communicate with her and I'm going to, I'll, I'll try and copy everyone, um, committee members on that email and I'll, with Nolan's fiscal note. I believe that Senator Kitchell will be familiar with the mental health and substance use disorder money because she was um, a part of that right. bill in 2018. So she'll, she should be familiar with it. Okay. All right. Well, I can assure you she's she's aware of that money. I'm sure she. <laughs> Any money that's not spent, of course we're aware of it. Okay. Any other comments, discussion, questions? All right, um, committee. Thank you for your work today, and thank you, um, Representative Reed, Representative Christensen, and Ina and Bacchus for being here with us today. As we take the bill up, we might rely on your expertise again. So um, keep an eye out and we'll keep you posted. Thank you. I think uh, committee, unless I hear something different from you, uh, we have achieved the goal of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee in finishing early. So. Is there anything else we need to do, Jen, Nolan? Okay. Thank you all. Um, Seven minutes on. Thank you. See you at one o'clock. Take Bye, care. Kids. Nellie, Bye. We're, we're good to, to end. Thank you.